All right, we are live. We should be live. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Creative Cloud Monday. That's right. It is Monday. I keep thinking it's like Friday again. It's not. So welcome, everybody. Happy Monday. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a topic that I don't spend a lot of time streaming about, but every now and then it comes up from a request from users. Um, I have uh, said this many times before. I dabble in Premiere and After Effects, but it's not my main focus. Premiere is, and After Effects is the focus of my colleague, Jason Levine. So if you wanted to know more about, or more about video editing and special effects and audio, you should probably watch Jason's videos and Jason Levine because he streams on it regularly, like weekly. Um, however, this one did come up and it's sort of photography related and I figured, eh, why not? I know how to do it, so why not do it? And uh, my friend Larry was basically asking, hey, does Premiere Pro have the Ken Burns effect? And for those of you who don't know what the Ken Burns effect is, uh, Ken Burns, a documentary filmmaker, made an effect famous by basically taking old photos, since there was no video of these scenes, and having them animate to be bigger, smaller, zoom in, pan across. So that just instead of just seeing a, a picture on screen for five seconds that doesn't move, uh, the, 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 the uh, term Ken Burns effect was coined after his video, after his, vid after his movies. Uh, so with that said, although Premiere Pro doesn't have a Ken Burns effect, there is a way to do it. There is a way to make images move. And uh, once you get the motion down pat, you can even copy and paste that effect to other photos. So you don't have to do it manually every single time. All right. So with that said, uh, Kevin, Stevie, Colleen, all the way from South Africa, Roy, John, Brittany, welcome, 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 Dr. Remy, uh, Dave, Soren, Ty, welcome everyone from all over the world. Uh, Victoria's in the house, Amber's in the house, Daryl, thank you for being here. All right, so with that said, and, and most of the shout outs out of the way, I know I didn't get everybody. Uh, there's Artis Sanders uh, also on Twitter. Let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. So I'm gonna switch over to the computer. I've got Premiere Pro running in the foreground. I've got Photoshop open in the background. I don't think I'm going to need Photoshop. So let me go ahead and quit out of Photoshop just to free up some resources. Um, but if I switch back to Premiere Pro, we'll go ahead and just start with Premiere Pro. And when I say um, uh, save some resources, uh, Premiere Pro and Photoshop and After Effects take a lot of memory, especially when you're running them all together. So if you're just having one open and you're not really using it, then you can make one program run faster by closing the other ones you're not using. Uh, so since I don't plan on using Photoshop for this, I don't need to have it running. If I need to open it, it's pretty quick to open anyway. All right, so I've got Premiere Pro from scratch, no document open, no project open. So how does this work? You're gonna start off just by simply creating a new project. It's gonna ask you, what do you wanna call this project? And where do you want to save it? So I've created a folder on my desktop called Learn PR for Learn Premiere. And I'm just going to go ahead and um, call this project um, Making Photos Move. I'm not going to call it Ken Burns because it's really not, although I'm going to mimic what he does, it's really not a built-in effect. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and click OK. That will give me an empty project saved to that folder that I told it to save it in. And um, Patrick, all the way from Sweden, welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, Kinga as well. Thanks for being here as well. All right, so now I've got my empty project ready to go. And the first thing you might want to think about is which workspace do you want to be in? So Premiere Pro makes it really easy by exposing the things that you're likely to use and hiding things that you aren't likely to use depending on what you're doing. So you might either be in the assembly work, workspace when you're assembling clips together, makes the project window bigger, put your timeline at the, at the top, uh, gets rid of the source window if you don't need it, and puts the sequence down here at the bottom. I like to work in the editing uh, workspace because it gives me the source and program monitor, the timeline, and the project window. Uh, it's just kind of what I'm used to. You can work any way you want. And of course, when I'm ready to do titling and graphics and all that, I like to be in the graphics workspace uh, for that kind of work. So let's go ahead and go back to the editing workspace, pick whichever one you want. And now we're gonna go ahead and you need to bring in at least one video. 
um, you don't have to, you can just work with stills. Let's say you don't have any video at all and you just want to animate stills, you can just work with stills. But if you bring in a video, especially a video that's the size, what I mean by size, the um, resolution that you want the ultimate finished project to be, it'll just make it easier. So I want a 1080p video, 1920 by 1080. Uh, if I wanted a 4K video, I'd bring in a 4K clip that I shot with my camera, my drone, my iPhone, whatever it was. Uh, so just having a single clip makes setting up the project easier. It's not a requirement, but it makes it easier. So I'm going to double click on the project window. It's going to ask me, what do you want to bring in? I'm going to go to that folder that I was just talking about, the Learn Premiere, and I've got some drone clips. So I've got, these are all 1080p. I think I want the one in the middle. Yep, that's a good one to bring in. Let's go ahead and import it. And that will bring in that video. Now, why did I say this makes it easier? Because once you have a video that's the size you want your finished project to be, then all you have to do is drag that video from the project over to the sequence window, and it will make a project that's 1080p or 4K or 720p or whatever it is you asked for. If you bring a still over to that area, It'll work, but it's going to be the, the project's going to be the size of the still. So if you shot with a 48 megapixel image or, or camera, then your timeline's 48 megapixels, so to speak. And that may be too big for the video you want. So this is just an easier way to get the exact size of video you need. Wide screen, pretty much everyone can play 1080p, uh, works on YouTube, Facebook, so forth and so on. If you don't need it to be that big, you can even go smaller, 720p. All right, but it's high def, ready to go. Now, if I don't do anything else and just hit play, hit the space bar, it'll play this drone video in Iceland where I was flying my drone over this beautiful mountain scene. And it's playing it back as close to real time as it can. And this is kind of just the video. So you're probably not seeing it in real time because you're watching it on a stream, but I'm just scrubbing the video back and forth. Now, again, this has nothing to do with the stills unless you want to put your stills integrate it into your video. So, for example, you can either play the video all the way, put some stills on the end. You can play the video to a certain point, cut it, put some stills in the middle. Or, let's say it's you talking and you want to illustrate something, you could have a still over the top of the video while you're still talking underneath. Now, of course, we're gonna see the still, not the part of the video that you put it over, but that's fine if that's all you, if you wanted to illustrate your point rather than see your talking head. All right, so it doesn't matter which way you do it. I, matter of fact, I might show you a couple different ways. All right, so now let's bring in the stills. If I go back to the um, folder that I was in, I have a, a image or a, a folder called drone images. Uh, and these are just different uh, shots I've taken over the years with my um, Mavic drones. I had a Mavic, Mavic Pro in Iceland. I have a Mavic Air that I've used as well. So these are just all different drone shots. Now I can bring them all in. I can bring one in, I can bring two in, bring as many as I want. So if I drag them all over to the project window or the little bin, that will bring them all over and then I can use any one I want. Okay, so now we're back to the project and now I wanna go ahead and um, pick one of these to animate, to demonstrate the process, because it doesn't matter which still it is. Once you learn the steps, you're going to just rinse and repeat and do the exact same thing over and over and over again. Um, so, for example, if I double click on one of these, it'll show me, and that's kind of a drone shot of the same video. I just looked up and picked one. Um, if I double click on this one, it'll show me that one. That's almost identical as well. And if I double click on this one, those are some trees. Uh, different location, that's in the water, of course, that's a, a lighthouse. So let's go back to one of these. Let's pick that one. So let's say I want to move that photo on my video and then animate that photo. So I'm going to just drag it over and I'm going to put it right on top wherever my playhead was, or you can put it anywhere you want. You don't have to put it on the top. You can put it over there. You can put it at the beginning. You can put it wherever you want it to be in time. Now, um, when you drag over an image by default, that image will be, I can get it to come up here, that image will be, um, I'm just trying to grab the duration, 
basically five seconds, four seconds and 29 frames. So about five seconds by default. So if you want it to stay up longer than five seconds, you would just grab the end of it and pull it out. Now it's gonna be longer than five seconds. If you want it to be less than five seconds and it's showing you the duration while you're dragging it, 10 seconds, eight seconds, seven seconds, six seconds, five seconds, two seconds, three seconds, whatever it is you want, you can drag it or you can actually right click on it. There we go. Go to speed and duration and you can type in exactly what you want it to be. So let's say I want this one to be exactly eight seconds. So eight seconds and zero frames. So now that will stretch it out and make it exactly eight seconds. Not seven seconds, not six seconds, not nine seconds, exactly eight. So you can go ahead and make that, that still stay up as long or short as you want it to be. Maybe you only want it to do a frame at a time. Like you can just pop them in one second and they will just play one second and flip through the through the, um, images. Uh, Colleen's asking, can you do text over video? Of course you can. This is Premiere. You can do pretty much anything. So think of Premiere as the Photoshop for video. So that when people ask, can you, the answer nine times out of 10 is yes. There's even a text tool and you can just click and type right over top of the video, make it say what you want. There's also animated um, lower thirds and titles and all kinds of things. We did that on the last stream. But yes, you can absolutely grab the type tool, click right on your video and start typing. Okay, so now if I were to hit play, we would get eight seconds of a still image. Very boring. And this is the part, this is why people tend to want to have some motion, even if it's just panning a little bit or zooming a little bit or panning and zooming a little bit just so it's not just sitting there for eight seconds. Okay, so um, the other thing to note is that when I pulled it over, it came over at the 100% size of that still. So over here, notice we can see sky. We don't see any sky over here on the video because the image is bigger than 1080p. It's bigger than 1920 by 1080. So we're seeing a bigger zoomed out version of the image because it came over at 100%. And that's great. So people ask, how big should I export my images out to put in a video? And I said, depends. If you're going to zoom and scale and make them big, bigger and smaller, you want bigger images. So that way they maintain their resolution when you make them bigger. If you're just gonna make them be static, no bigger than 1920 by 1080 because they don't need to be any bigger if they're not gonna scale in size. So this image is bigger than the video. So at the, at the larger size, it still looks good. Okay, next up. Now here's the big part. How do we make it move? How do we make it do anything? Because right now it's static. Maybe I want to start smaller or no, let's do it this way. Maybe I want to start bigger and zoom down over eight seconds. So to do that, come down to your, um, to your image with the selection tool and double click. When you double click, that will put your image the same image that's on the timeline, it'll put it in the source window. Now, if you double clicked it over here from the project, that will put it in the source window too, but you want the one in the source window that's actually being used on the timeline because that's the one you're gonna affect with controls or you're gonna um, affect with what you're about to do. So from the timeline, double click, that puts it in the source window. Now you can go to the very important Effect controls, this is the tab where all the magic happens. When you click on that tab, then you can do everything you want. So um, it even gives you a little timeline of the still. So this is eight seconds of it doing nothing. So you can start anywhere in, in the middle. You can start at the beginning, you can start at the end, which probably wouldn't make much sense, but you can start anywhere you want to have the motion start. So I'm gonna start at the very beginning. I just move the playhead back to the beginning of that clip. Now you'll notice over here, you've got position, scale, rotation. Let's stick to those. Those are the main ones you're gonna need. There, there are other, you have opacity, so you can even fade it in. Uh, but those four probably are the main ones you're ever gonna use. Position, scale, rotation, and opacity. All right, you'll notice also next to each one that there's a little, the little stopwatch. The little stopwatch is what's key to tell it to do this over time. 
So um, what I want to do is I want to change two things over time. I want to change the position over time, and I want to change the scale over time. The position is the coordinates, where it is on, on the, on the um, timeline. It's at 960 by 540, physically in that rectangle. 100%, that means it's 100% size. So I could scale it up, make it bigger. I could scale it down, make it smaller and make it fit so we can even see the video behind it. I can do whatever I want with scale and scale is showing me exactly how big it is. So let's say we wanna zoom in that much, 186% and of course you can type it in. Let's say I want it to go to 180 exactly. So at 180%, that's where I want it to start zooming down from. Next, where do I want it to be positioned? So I can either manually move the numbers and move it around or just pick it up and move it. It's easier to pick it up and move it in most cases. So how do I pick it up and move it? Come over to the actual program window, double click on it, and then you can pick it up and move it. So you can say, hey, I would love for it to start maybe here on this grass and move this way. So how do I tell it to move this way and get smaller at the same time? Now we move the playhead because we want this to happen over eight seconds. So we just simply move the playhead. Nothing's happening because we haven't done this over time. Oh, let I me, mean, I, mean, I should have told you one more thing first. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's pick it up and move it. To make, before you move the playhead, to do this over time, you want to tell it to do it over time. Click the stopwatch for position, click the stopwatch for scale. Now it knows whatever changes you make to do those things over time. And it sets what's called a little keyframe for those two things. So those little diamonds right there say 180% uh, scale and position wherever it is. Now you can move the playhead. Move the playhead after you click the stopwatch. So I move the playhead, let's say to right there. Now I'm gonna say, just make the changes I wanna make. I wanna zoom it down, maybe to maybe 112%, 115%, and then pick it up and move it over. So there we go, something like, I don't wanna see the edges of it, so I'm just gonna keep moving it until I don't see any edges. And of course, the, the more you move it, meaning the further distance it has to go from that corner all the way down to that corner, the faster it's gonna go. If you just move it a little bit, slower it's gonna go. Cause no matter what, it's gonna happen over roughly eight seconds, a little bit less. So now if I were to go back in time, move the playhead, it's actually doing it. It's moving the image and scaling the image based on just me moving and scaling the image. It's doing it for me. If I get here and I say, you know what? I even want it to be smaller. I can scale it down and make it smaller, but then again, I gotta also maybe not show the edge. So that's what it will do over time. So now if we were to go here and play our video, we have video playing, so the drone's flying and moving, then it's gonna get to the still, the still comes in and moves over eight seconds while you're talking, explaining, music's happening, whatever, it's doing its thing. And then it goes to, um, Back to the video because the the image ended. All right, now there was a little jump there at the end. I think it's because I moved it twice. Yep, I moved it twice. I did not, um, or I, should, I could just fix that just by moving these little diamonds over. Yeah, there's another diamond, that's why. All right, let's see. So um, when I moved it twice, it created two keyframes. So let's see what happens there. Yep, and I don't want it to zigzag. So I can just pick that one up as well, move that one over, pick that one up, move that one over, and now there should be no zigzag at the end. There, perfect, okay. So I basically told it to take up the whole eight seconds for this move. Now the next thing I wanna do is I want to bring in another still, and we'll just bring in something else random just so we have a difference in look. So we'll bring in this lighthouse. So I'll bring in the lighthouse, I'll put it right next to it. Now the lighthouse is not eight seconds. It's only five seconds, four seconds, 29 frames by default. And I could make it eight seconds and I probably should because what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna just copy the exact same effect and apply it. Uh, so let's do that first. I could probably do the copy as well, but let's 
just do, we're going to do the same thing, speed and duration, make it eight seconds and zero frames. Okay, perfect. Now they're both the exact same length, but one moves and one doesn't. So if I go back and play, this one's moving. When it gets to the new one, the new one just sits there because nothing's been done to it yet. And this is what I meant by not having to do the same thing over and over again. Once you get one effect, and you might vary them. You might do one starting from the lower left, the next one starting from the upper right, the third one starting from the middle. But no matter how many different variations you make, instead of having to do them all manually, what you can do then is say, hey, I want whatever I just did to this one to be the exact same thing that happens to the next one. So I just copy. Edit, copy, go to the next one, click on it, edit, not paste, but paste attributes. Meaning don't paste the actual frame, the, the still, paste what I did to it. So when I say paste attributes, it will give me motion and opacity and anything else I, I wanna check off that I've done to it. So I can now click okay, and now it has the exact same effect applied to it. So now we hit play, that one moves, and now the next one moves exactly the same way. Now, I may not like that one moving the exact same way, but it does. And I don't like that one moving the exact same way because you never see the lighthouse. So it will vary depending on the photo. Now, if you want to go back and make changes to this one, double click on it to bring it back to the effects controls, uh, the source window, and then you go to your effect controls and you go to the beginning and you say, hey, you know what? When it's at this spot, we're not seeing enough of the lighthouse. Let's move it down. There we go. So now if we play that one, it'll start from there and then move and scale. So you can make adjustments even if you did a copy and paste after the fact. Maybe you want that one to get smaller as it goes. Maybe you want to go in a different direction. So let's do one more. Let's do one more manually. Um, let's see what this one is. Nope, not that one. Let's pick something else. Yeah, we'll pick that one. Okay, so we'll drag that one over. It's going to be the same default 4 seconds, 29 frames. This time, we're not going to make it longer. We're just going to put it in place, and we're going to have it do something else. We're going to have it scale and up and move over. So same thing, double click. So this is kind of a rinse and repeat. Go to your effect controls. Move the timeline or the playhead back to the beginning. Set your position and scale, and now do whatever it is you want to do. So for position, um, I kind of like it where it is. I don't know that I want to move it. Let's see. Eh, maybe I can show more of the sky. Okay, great. Well, I kind of liked it where it was, but we'll move it down. And then we'll go to the end. All the way to the end, to the end, end. And then we do whatever else we want to do. So I can say scale it up. And of course, we wanted to zoom in on the lighthouse, we move the lighthouse over. There we go. So that's what's going to happen to that one. So here's what's going to happen. Play. That lighthouse goes away. The next lighthouse comes up and zooms in faster because it's only five seconds, four seconds, 29 frames. It's the, the, Therefore, it won't take as long to get there. Now I can I can play. I can mix and match. Let's do one more. This is ice. It's not Iceland, but it's ice. <laughs> Let's see. And that's just a neighborhood. Let's drag this one over. And let's uh, copy and paste those effects. So we're going to go edit, copy, and select and paste attributes. And just click OK. Yes. So now that one's going to do the exact same thing. So this one pans, scales up. This one pans, scales up, may not be the interesting spot that you want it, but if you want to copy and paste, it does it. Now you can mix them, you can mix them up. They don't have to play in the order you start it. I can put this one on the end. I can put this last one I just did over here. I can move, um, let's break it up some. Let's actually move this one over here and move this one next to it. Okay, great. So now if I were to hit play, We get this one, eight seconds. 
We get the next one, 4 seconds, 29 frames. We get the next one, 8 seconds. And we get the last one, um, 4 seconds, 29 frames. All right. Perfect. Okay. Now, I said I would show you, well, that's playing over the top of your video. But what if you wanted these to interrupt your video? Maybe you wanted a segment of, hey, now let's look at some of my photography, so to speak. And you don't want video playing underneath it. You want the video to stop, play the stills, and pick up where you left off. Well, for that, all you need to do is just leave the hole for it. So, for example, let's say at this spot, I want that first one to play while I was talking. Then I just want music or silence or whatever to play until these next two or these next three finish. Then I want the video to pick back up again. So I would just grab the razor and make a cut of the video right there. Then I pick the video, the, the part I just cut in half, the second part, move it over. So now that video will literally stop at that point play the stills and pick up after the stills are done. So it would still look the same because the stills were playing over the top of it anyway. But when it gets to the end, the video picks right back up where it stopped or was cut in the first place. So that way you can have it interrupt. And, the, and, and notice I, I left the gap. I didn't bring the stills down. It doesn't matter. It, what matters is visually, just like your Photoshop layers, Whatever's on top shows. So the stills are on top of that empty space, they're gonna show. The only time that would matter is if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to um, make the still smaller than the actual video frame, there would be black under it right now because it would be transparent. Okay, Colleen's asking one more thing, zoom out and fade. So depending on what you want your fade to look like. If you just wanted it to transition out, you can just click on one. And uh, my default transition is Command D, yours would be Control D on Windows. And it will put a default transition of a cross dissolve on the end of that clip. So now if I were to put the video just slightly under it, it would fade the still out to that, um, to that video like this. Fades out. Notice how it just smoothly faded the, the still out and started playing the video. That's an easy way to do it. If you want to fade one, one still out into another still, you could do it with transitions or you can just do it with opacity. So for example, let's say we grab a different still. More ice. All right, we'll grab the waterfront. We'll drag that one now on top of these. So, um, again, you can do it with transitions or you can do it with op opacity, either one. So I could say, hey, this one's now going to play over the top of these two. What do I want to happen? I can Command D and it will do a transition between those two like this. Cool. And then when it gets to the end, it'll fade out, show the other one underneath it, or undo, take the transition out, and you can manually do it. So you can manually do it a few ways. Um, you can do it with the effect controls. I don't want to get too deep into this, but you can do it with the effects effect controls easy as well. So let's say you just want to do the scale and you want to do the opacity. Oh, sorry, undo, put it back to the beginning. Scale and opacity is already set to be a keyframe. So now let's say that I want this to start out at zero, fade it out so you can control how much opacity you want, start out at zero. And then when it, you know, cause if you, if you give it a number, it will start fading in from zero immediately. So, and that's fine, that's what we want. So here we want to, let's say, be 100 by the time it gets to this point. So it'll just fade up to 100 at that point. I still haven't done anything with scale, so it's just it's just sitting there at the same size. Now I can also be scaling it. Let's do it down. Scaling it at the same time. Now, that means it's gonna get to that spot and just stay static until the end, and then it will stop. Let's say, 
near the end, I also want it to fade down. Let's say even not at the end. Let's say I want it to slowly fade down. Well, that means I need another 100% at this spot before it ramps down to zero. And the easiest way to do that is to um, add the same exact keyframe of the last one. In other words, whatever it is right now. So I just click this little, I know we're getting off track here, but this little shortcut adds the exact same keyframe of whatever it is right now. So now I can go to the end and say, um, go down to zero at this point. So it will go from zero to 100%, stay at 100% till it gets to that keyframe, then slowly fade down to zero. So yes, that's how you can do it, Kelly. All right, um, can you import a Spark video and edit more in here? If so, how? Well, the problem is, to answer your question, yes, you can import a Spark video. The problem is it wouldn't be in an editable state because in order to get it out of Spark, you'd have to render out the video. So once you brought that video in, then it's just a clip. You wouldn't be able to change the text or, or change it around in any way. It would be a static video. You can add more on top of it. You can add the stills on top of it. You can add titles. You can do all that stuff, but you wouldn't be editing the Spark video per se itself. Um, okay. All right. Um, Kyle's been like sounding off in the chat over on Facebook, giving all kinds of tips. Thanks. And using photos, JPEG, or computer crashes, and uh, using too many photos with effects. Okay, Gabriel, that sounds like it could be a memory issue. Hey, Liz Smith. Um, not sure why. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Thank you. Nice views to move. Yes, that's all my drone photography. And I think I got everybody. Yep. Amber, see you Thursday. All right, great. Uh, so that was in a nutshell, how to make photos move in Premiere. Everything you do at this point is just adding on what I said. Um, changing opacity, changing the time, moving you know, the distance between the keyframes to make it happen quicker or shorter, uh, changing any other attributes, rotation, for example. Let's do one more real quick. Let's say that I wanted to change the rotation of this one while it was doing it. So rotation is another effect that's used sparingly <laughs> because you don't want people to get dizzy while you're rotating every single photo. So let's say at the beginning, I want to add a keyframe. And I want this photo to rotate. Um, let's do it. I'll do about that much. Okay. And so now, so that photo comes in already rotated. That's too much. Let's go back. And maybe rotate like 10%, 15%. Okay. And then. I want by the time it gets here to rotate the other way. So over, and it's going to be shake. It's going to be bad because it's rotating a lot quickly, but you can do rotation over time as well. I wouldn't rotate to that extreme, maybe just a slight amount of rotation while it's panning, zooming, scaling, whatever you want. But yes, rotation could happen. Opacity can happen. Everything can happen with your photos. Don't do not do that. Don't rotate it that much, but you can make it happen. All right, so that's it. Hope you got something out of this. Hope that you were able to um, pick it up. If not, you can always go back and rewatch the parts you weren't clear on. Uh, because like I said, now I've repeated it like three times. It's just doing those same things over and over again for every single still or copying and pasting the effects or attributes still to still, especially if they're all the same size. The only problem with copying and paste, the point of interest might be different between the photos. Like the lighthouse is over on the right in this photo, maybe in another photo it's on the left. So zooming into the right is irrelevant on a photo where the lighthouse is on the left. So some of this you will want to do manually, but that's also the advantage of it because you can specify the exact motion for every single still. It's not like an automated effect like Ken Burns where it's panning and zooming. <laughs> I've seen Ken Burns do some, some automated awful things in programs that have it because it's panning and zooming into spots you don't want it to, like someone's private areas and things like that. You don't want it to zoom in 
on someone's chest. You don't want to zoom in someone's, you know, whatever. So this way you control exactly where it zooms. Maybe it's a crowd of people and you want to pan their faces as they as it goes across. So you're controlling exactly where it does it. All right. So with that said, cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. And we will catch you on the next one. Bye, everybody.